So this is the last uh, session of the last day of the four day symposium and uh, <coughs> uh, now invite uh, Professor uh, Raman Sundaram from University of Maryland to give the talk on uh, what is it? Extra dimensions, compactified extra dimensions, ADS, CFT and LHC. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak here. And of course, uh, very happy birthday to all of you and to the Institute. Um, so uh, in this talk, I wanted to uh, describe a, what I call a new paradigm for particle physics that has come up in the last uh, dozen years. And there's been a massive effort by theorists and now by experimentalists to develop this subject. So it's the work of many hands. Um, so I want to describe particle physics from that viewpoint. And, uh, but the other thing I wanted to do, which is not so often done in talks, because it takes a little time, is to describe the same physics from two equivalent viewpoints connected by this most powerful duality ever discovered in theoretical physics, OK, ADS-CFT correspondence. And uh, there are some things from one view. These are the two eyes we have on this very tricky problem. Um, and uh, each of them catches some things easily and misses some things easily. And so you really think two eyes are better than one. And I want to describe a little bit the methodology, OK? Um, nothing I do in this talk is very technical uh, because I do it at the level of cartoons. But I'll try and give references where you can learn the subject, and read more. Okay? And then finally, I want to connect it to the other great endeavor that's going on in our time, which is uh, the, the experiments at the LHC. And again, it's only for lack of time that I will not say too much about these things. There are people in the audience, even, who have worked on these things um, in, in greater detail. Okay? Um, so I just wanted to start with sort of this state of play of fundamental physics, just to quickly remind you what you already know, which is that in some way, humans have put their fingers into every range of distances or energies that you can conceive of, all the way from dark energy probed at the largest scales in the universe, the size of the universe, all the way to thinking about quantum gravity or even doing experiments that have at least virtual sensitivity to the highest possible scales, okay? Where beyond that point, the notion of point particle physics breaks down. Um, with the, oh, I see, I'm going to lose the last line in each case. Hmm, okay. Um, well, so with this year's discovery or report of discovery of the uh, Higgs boson at 125 GeV, the standard model itself is finally complete. And uh, it makes sense as a theory to very, very high energy scales. Um, and so let me just take you through the kind of body of experiments that, that we're talking about. Um, and this, will, this sort of the range of discussion will take up most of the talk, although I'm happy after the talk to discuss even things you know, going all this way, OK? Because I think the paradigm I'm describing connects all these dots in some way. It gives you a world view that connects all these things. So certainly, we have, again, data from the last couple of decades really pointing to neutrino masses and mixing angles. That's a new kind of data that we have and a new kind of pattern or change of pattern relative to quarks. Um, there are collider searches, which have probed up to TeV-ish energies. There are electroweak precision tests, which are Again, collider searches, but working to several decimal places that are really testing loop processes in the electroweak theory and are sensitive to new physics showing up in electroweak loops, um, which are up to of order 10 TeV. There are tests of CP violation from beyond the standard model, which would contribute to electric dipole moments, again, sensitive in that scale. Flavor changing neutral currents because of their very special and highly suppressed structure through the gym mechanism of the standard model, we are sensitive to new effects 
at two very high scales, okay? If you have massive flavor violation, but you have energy scales or new physics even living at uh, 1,000 TeV, uh, we would be sensitive to, to it in these experiments. And if you add CP violation, even 100,000 TeV, okay? So we have, at the virtual level, incredible sensitivity by looking at rare processes. Um, the standard model itself, forget supersymmetry or what you've heard about supersymmetry, the standard model itself, if you extrapolate the gauge couplings to high energies, these couplings appear to meet, not perfectly, but they appear to meet roughly in the vicinity of 10 to 14 GeV. Um, it's a striking fact. If you had never heard of supersymmetry, had never been exposed to supersymmetry plots, just looking at the standard model, you would say, look, something is going on right there. I wonder what the whole story is. Um, the standard model particle content, at least the fermionic particle content, organizes itself according to the quantum numbers that you would get from grand unified theories. We do experiments testing for proton stability, or rather for proton decay, which are sensitive to particles mediating proton decay, which could live way up there at the highest possible scales you can imagine. And we have theoretical ideas that we think about uh, trying to make sense of quantum gravity like string theory. Okay. Um, the standard model comes with some puzzles. That is, it is a theory that makes logical sense over a vast range of the experimental terrain. But on the other hand, um, it, it does pose some puzzles. And the classic one that many of you know is the question of electroweak stability. Why is the weak scale so much smaller than higher scales that presumably exist? Grand unified scale, Planck scale, and so on. And of course, the classic Feynman diagram showing the delicacy of electroweak symmetry breaking comes from studying the uh, self-energy of the Higgs boson. The Higgs that you want to be roughly of order the weak scale um, gets radiative corrections sensitive to the highest possible scales in the theory. We usually say big quadratic divergences. Now, if the standard model was in isolation and renormalizable just by itself, then this business of working out the divergences in Feynman diagrams would just be an intermediate step in renormalizing the theory. But, so you could say, really, I shouldn't take seriously any intermediate step. Who cares if they're quadratic divergences? Renormalize it and keep going. But, but actually, the standard model exists, coexists with gravity. And gravity ultimately, quantum gravity ultimately provides a real meaning to this cutoff. If nothing else, gravity says the Planck scale is the ultimate cutoff, okay? Um, in the sense that all the basis of quantum field theory, which are these point-like local couplings, lose their meaning at order of the Planck length. If you try to probe the pointiness of particle interactions at distances smaller than the Planck length, the amount of energy you have to pump in by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to resolve such a small distance would back react and give you a black hole larger than the Planck length, okay? So it really poses a kind of a shortest distance, very much the way that field theory in the solid state realm um, comes with a short distance cutoff, which is the separation between different atoms on a lattice, for example, okay? Where the continuum picture of field theory has to break down. So that is the context that, uh, at least that's the way I would think about it, and take seriously that these very big radiative corrections exist and have to cancel to an incredible precision in order to maintain the weak Planck hierarchy if the standard model was the entire picture, okay? And that is the hierarchy problem. But, and as you know, supersymmetry provides a rather beautiful symmetry rationale for why all the different corrections which are Planckian in size, why should they cancel to such high degree? And supersymmetry certainly gives a very nice uh, symmetry reason why that should be so. Um, having said that, the LHC has certainly made very large uh, cuts into the parameter space that a priori you would have thought were the motivated regions of SUSY parameter space, and we haven't seen supersymmetry. Now, I think the story is far from over. I'm not trying to say that supersymmetry is dead or anything like that. There's a huge game that still has to play out before people would ever give up on the idea that supersymmetry is solving the hierarchy problem. Nevertheless, one should consider all the options. Um, the other option to the deep principle of supersymmetry is the deep principle that strong coupling comes in beyond the standard model 
and it is really something that provides the major alternative mechanism for evading the electroweak hierarchy problem. Okay, and the idea that strong coupling has something to do with the hierarchy problem beyond the standard model, um, especially in the Higgs sector, is something that goes back to the days of Technicolor, and many of the ideas that go back 30 years are, are going to be harnessed, refined, and used in this new paradigm that I want to tell you about. New in the sense, last dozen years. So I want to sort of phrase it in a, just so that we move rapidly, I want to phrase it in a kind of renormalization group viewpoint, okay? Um, so here is an effective Lagrangian with a renormalization point mu, which is smaller, much smaller, say, than this cutoff of my theory, which you can think of as the Planck scale, if you like, or some formal cutoff. And in a weakly coupled standard model, we know in weak coupling perturbation theory, if you want to keep track of divergences or sensitivity to a cutoff or higher scales, that you can do a quick job by doing power counting. Power counting, for example, if I say that the dimension of the Higgs squared operator is two, its canonical dimension is two, then I say that I'm typically, unless there's a symmetry like supersymmetry, which I'm going to put aside for this talk, then I expect without a symmetry that I'm going to get quadratic divergences so that the, t the dimension two here and the dimension two here adds up to four, okay? So that's what we're taught about how to figure out which places to expect divergences. And everything is true up to logs, okay? So that's standard perturbation theory in a, in a nutshell. So here it's already a dimension four operator, so you get some logs, and here you get quadratic divergences, and then you get some logs. That's the story you've been taught in perturbation theory. Um, and if you do something a little fancier, namely like some renormalization group resummed perturbation theory, and you wave function renormalize this term, you can get something that looks like this. Again, there is your sort of quadratic divergence, can't quite get rid of it, but the sort of resumming of these logs will show up. I'm being sloppy here, deliberately, um, but, but basically you get some anomalous dimension terms that resum the large logs. But secretly, if you expand this anomalous dimension in perturbation theory is a series in alpha. So when you expand in alpha, you just recover some series of logs that have been resummed to all orders in leading order in, log, large, in large logs in, in, in perturbation theory. And so this is what you're used to. This kind of formula is what you're used to in perturbation theory. Um, however, I'm saying it like this because this kind of picture, this formula, carries over to strong coupling. So if you had some sort of strong coupling regime beyond the standard model, what I mean by BSM, you'd have something that still looks like this, but now this is not just some innocent sum of logs which do not help you with this quadratic sensitivity to the highest scales. Instead, at strong coupling, this gamma, which is a function of the coupling, the coupling is no longer small, so in fact, any function of it might well be bigger, might be order one. For example, if this thing is greater than or equal to two, then you can see that the quadratic sensitivity to the cutoff is gone and replaced with just something sensitive to the scales at which you're operating, okay? So the message here is that strong coupling can overwhelm naive power counting, which you're taught when studying perturbation theory and divergence structures. So what really matters, and I'm sorry it's cut off here, what really matters is not the canonical scale dimension of this operator, but rather its true scaling dimension in strong coupling, which is the sum of canonical dimension plus anomalous dimensions. And anomalous dimensions are usually in perturbation theory just a bunch of logs. Here, the anomalous dimensions can be solid of order one kind of effect, and that can completely change the, or eliminate, as you can see, the, the hierarchy problem, or if you like, sensitivity to the highest scales, okay? So that's the plan for solving the hierarchy problem. There's another kind of puzzle that we see, and I'll just use the example of quark masses, um, or the quark sector, which is the flavor puzzle. If you look at the particle data book and all of the flavor structure that we see there in terms of the CKM angles and the quark masses, uh, there is unmistakable, I, I think it is, everybody agrees that there is some sort of a pattern. These are not 
all of these numbers are supposed to be order one numbers from the standard model renormalizability structure. They're just supposed to be order one coupling constants. They don't look quite order one. There's something very hierarchical about them. And there's some sort of correlation between masses and mixing angles. Um, and to say it quickly and move on, I'm just going to give one way of envisioning it. Why do I say envision rather than say, here is the exact formula. It's like the bomber series. Here's the formula. Let's invent the theory. It's because it's murkier than that. It's a little vaguer than that. It's sloppier than that. But here's one attempt to capture it. The standard model, oops, the standard model Yukawa couplings look, say, up and down matri Yukawa matrices. Here are generational indices. Seem to be well described, more suggestively described, by sort of taking the square root a kind of a square root of each Yukawa coupling in terms of factorizing it into some hierarchical left-handed parameters multiplied by up-type parameters and left-handed times down-type epsilons, and some order one factors. That's sort of the fuzz in this way of looking. It's not a sharp formula that we're seeing. Um, where are these epsilons? You can see there are nine of them. These epsilons are smaller than one and, and very hierarchical. This seems to be one quick way of capturing what is so special about the data. Okay? So when you see these things that were supposed to be dimensionless couplings in a renormalizable theory that happen to be hierarchically small, again, it could be that beyond the standard model, these small things arose by renormalization group effects that created power law suppression instead of just logs in some Yukawa's running from the Planck scale, somewhere along the line there was strong coupling and instead of logs you got some power law effect in the, in the renormalization scale and it gave you a kind of power law suppression and you're getting uh, these small things. And it's sort of flavor dependent renormalization group effects. Okay, so that's the suggestive feature. Um, so you're motivated, I hope, to think about strong coupling. Okay. If the, if the hierarchy problem exists robustly at weak coupling, let's look at strong coupling. But of course, it poses a very hard problem for theorists uh, because we are all taught to expand in alpha, the weak coupling. And um, it's not going to work here, right? So instead, you would love to be able to do something like a strong coupling expansion where you expand in 1 over alpha. Uh, then if the coupling is strong, it becomes your friend. Okay, um, I put the quotes here. There are strong coupling expansions known. If you know some lattice, lattice field theories, you can do strong coupling expansions and so on. Um, we want the right strong coupling expansion for the problems that face us. Uh, and I always put quotes here because in a weak coupling expansion, it's a rather straightforward thing. Since Feynman, you can pretty much automate it. In fact, it's automated. You can just buy a computer and do it that way. But there's always some degree of judgment and nuance in dealing with a strong coupling expansion, as I will show. It's always something subtle. Partly because at weak coupling, the limit of weak coupling is free. And so what the degrees of freedom in your Lagrangian are exactly what the experimentalist sees. At strong coupling, the degrees of freedom reorganize, like quarks and gluons turning into hadrons. And so what the experimentalist sees and what's in your Lagrangian are very different. And that's where all the nuance comes in. OK, so how do we go about this? We want to, th our job, as I've tried to set up, is to think about strong renormalization group effects. And these things, as we know, st strong renormalization group effects accumulate when you have strong coupling over a large hierarchy of scales, over a large range of scales. So by contrast, I want to show you the most famous strongly coupled theory, QCD. And here is the coupling as a function of renormalization scale. And this picture, this side here, is just what you call asymptotic freedom. Most of the hierarchy between the GV scale and the Planck scale, the QCD coupling is weak, at least in the standard model. It's a weakly coupled thing. So there's no point expanding in 1 over alpha. It's only around 1 GV that the QCD coupling becomes strong. And only briefly, as you move down in scale, because then rapidly, once it becomes strong, something big happens, namely confinement. Most of the confined particles are of order of GV, and then all you end up with are some pions, Goldstone bosons, 
at below GV, and they're in fact weakly coupled at low energies. So there's only, a, a, if you think in terms of RG scale, there's only a brief blip where you truly have strong coupling. Now something exciting happens in that blip, but you don't have uh, this large accumulation of RG effects due to strong coupling because most of the time it's weak. Here's something theoretically better, right? It's some sort of strong coupling. It does something interesting. It may even confine later, but it's always strong, okay? So maybe one could expand in one over alpha. Well, our job when you go into a hard problem is to do the easiest of the hard problems. The easiest of the hard problems looks like this, where I'm at strong coupling and the coupling doesn't change so that it looks about as uniform as it can get. And so this fixed coupling, I'm calling alpha star, okay? And we know why a coupling doesn't run. Why a coupling in any theory might not run is that its beta function is at a zero, that alpha star happens to be the zero of the beta function, okay? So this is a difficult thing to find for perturbative theories, but in a non-perturbative theory, or a theory studied non-perturbatively, one certainly has examples, and in general, one would expect that there are fixed points of the renormalization group flow where the coupling does not run, and if the fixed point happens to be strongly coupled, that's our easiest possible place to start, okay? Um, and we get something for choosing this instead of this. This theory is scale invariant. On every scale, it looks the same. So we have a new symmetry, scale invariance, and we want to milk it for all it's worth to help us try and develop this strong coupling expansion. In fact, it's even more powerful than that. It's a, a, a quantum field theory with scale invariance is conjectured to be a conformal field theory. And to say that, what I'm saying is that a scale symmetric quantum field theory is believed, and this is believed to be a very strong conjecture, to, be, to have yet another symmetry even more powerful than scale symmetry, and, and that is conformal symmetry. And if you want the final status report, I was writing this on the car over here. Um, this tells you the state of traffic in Chennai. Um, this conjecture, if you want the latest sort of report on to what extent it's proven, not proven, you can read it in this recent paper, okay? But, I want to buy the conjecture, okay? But I don't want to leave you hanging with no, absolutely no instinct for what conformal symmetry is if you haven't already run into it. So to do that, I'm going to treat a theory without quantum mechanics. Here is a classical field theory. Just think of this as a classical action. Now you see, if I want to give you a scale invariant classical action, I shouldn't write any mass terms down, right? Because otherwise there's a scale that I've explicitly introduced. Because I'm doing a classical theory, there aren't any RG scales floating around, so we don't have to worry about that. So here's a classically scale invariant theory. If you don't believe me, you can test it by plugging in this check and check that this action is invariant under this, where C is just a constant rescaling of X, okay? So I rescale this, this, the field as well as the coordinate and then plug it in and you can check this for yourself. But you can also check something else. You didn't ask for it. The reason I chose this action is simply so that it doesn't have any scales in it. It doesn't have any intrinsic scales in it. It doesn't have any mass terms. And so it's not surprising that it's invariant under scale transformations. But it happens, this is a shock the first time you see it, it happens to also be invariant under a different set of transformations. Here it is. Where this A mu is just some infinitesimal constant four vector. And these are called the special conformal transformations. And if I include scale invariants and Poincaré invariants, they form the so-called conformal symmetries, okay? So this is a classical proof in this theory that scale invariants happens to imply something even bigger, but it's true even at the quantum level, okay? So this is a really bizarre looking transformation. The coordinate, the coordinate, look at how it's changing. What intuition can you possibly have for that, okay? Um, indeed, conformal field theory is, was a kind of a very tricky thing that you had to be sort of mathematically immersed in order to sort of follow what was going on. Um, 
it would be great if there was a way you could just open your eyes and see exactly what the deep meaning behind this is. And since 1997, uh, at the birth of ADS-CFT, we have that tool, okay? And so, to quickly introduce it, I want, to, I want you to think of it as geometrizing the algebraic considerations and physics considerations behind a strongly coupled CFT. Throughout history, if you can geometrize a tough problem, you can see, you can feel it. And if you can't, then you have to be a blind mathematician, okay? Um, and that's the deep meaning behind the ADS-CFT correspondence. Uh, you'll see all the original references. I'm not being very good about original references, partly so I can cite my own papers, but here's a review and you can go see all the references yourself. Um, but let me try and give the intuition. I'm not doing a, a rigorous derivation, but this is very true to a more rigorous derivation of the grammar behind this duality. So first let me take the CFT and I'm trying to draw everything on a page, so let me take all three dimensions and pretend they're just two dimensions so I can draw it. And here is a state of the CFT. If this is a quantum field theory, this is a state, you could say this is a, this is a girl, and for reference, the Lego block out of which she's made are atoms. So there's an atom inside her eye. And everybody knows the Bohr radius is some fixed thing, you can count on it, it sets the standard for measuring distance, and so it sets the scale on which we can build this girl, okay? On the other hand, in a scale invariant theory, because it's self-similar, anything you can build on this scale, you can build on a smaller scale. You can't count on the atom as being of a fixed size. Anything, any state can be shrunk or expanded because you have scale symmetry. So here is the same girl, it's a state of a scale invariant conformal field theory, or conformal, well, a conformal field theory, but drawn smaller. Because scale invariance is a scalar, Lorentz scalar property, scale transformation scales both space and time, when you rescale the girl physically, her watch is also going to tick faster, okay? So if I could put animation in here, this one's clock is ticking faster than this one. You can continue the shrinking process to a point. And if you shrink it to a point, the state becomes a little dent in the vacuum, and dents in the vacuum are what are known as local operators in quantum field theory, okay? So that means that every shape that you could have macroscopically is secretly, in a conformal field theory, the, 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 the sort of blowing up of a particularly small balloon called a local operator, and you blow it up and it takes on whichever shape you want. So all the different shapes correspond to these local operators. You just provide the size, okay? This is the so-called state operator mapping in conformal field theory. Now, why am I pointing to this picture in this way? Because I want you to read this picture the way that I hope your eyes are already betraying you into doing, which is it might look that actually these girls are all the same size. Look, that atom and that atom, that looks smaller. When things which are of fixed size look smaller to you, you interpret them as further away. So, I've told you the true story, but there's an illusion, and it's the illusion that we use in all three-dimensional art rendered on a flat piece of paper, which is that the small state can be mistaken for a state of the same size with a rigid, Bohr radius, but just viewed as further back. And this girl here is infinitely far back. This point-like operator acting on the vacuum is infinitely far away, okay? Right on the horizon. I don't, don't take horizon literally. That has a technical meaning, but very, very far away. And so you have this kind of illusory, uh, illusory emergent direction of space. We've used up x, y, z. This, let's call this w. Okay? And we'll call it the fifth dimension since fourth dimension is time. Okay? So this gives a geometrical picture of at least scale invariance. But there's something that's trying to break the illusion. This is too dumb. Okay? Something is trying to break the illusion. This girl's clock is going faster. 
When I walk back, my clock doesn't go any faster. But actually, it does under some circumstances. If you go up and put a clock in a balloon, then that clock will tick about 10 to the minus 9 times faster than a clock on Earth. That is a prediction of general relativity called gravitational time dilation, but it is also a measured experimental fact. Okay. So here, she goes back just a few steps and her clock ticks twice as fast. It's almost trying to break the illusion that she's just taking a step back, unless you also say that there's a gravitational field which is pulling in this down, this is the downward direction. And so her clock is going fast because there's an incredible gravitational redshift uh, acting on this bigger, closer, closer girl. The other puzzle is, according to the CFT, the amount of time it would take to shrink a finite girl like this to a point is a finite amount of time. Working at the speed of light, if you want to collapse a state to a point, you can do it. It just takes you the amount of time given by the size of the girl in, relative, in C equals one units. Um, so you can do it, but it's puzzling from the illusion point of view. It looks like in a finite amount of time you can travel infinitely far away. Isn't that too bizarre? Well, all of these things happen to be true in curved space. So even though the CFT is framed in Minkowski space, which most of us came into the audience wanting to think about. The illusory space is actually a highly curved space. And in fact, the properties that I described are uniquely described by this metric, where the, the punchline is cut off here. So it's, the numerator here is just five-dimensional Minkowski space, but divided by W squared. This is the thing that gives the gravitational redshift that says that this girl's clock is slower than this girl's clock, okay? And the number of steps that she has to take before it becomes slower by a factor of two would be, or so, is given by the so-called radius of curvature of anti de Sitter space, which is this constant R ADS that you'll see from now on, okay? So that's the game. Um, so, Here's that metric. Here are the properties. It has obviously got four-dimensional translation invariants. This is just the Minkowski metric in four dimensions, so it's obviously Lorentz invariant. It has scale symmetry in this obvious realization. This is just a kind of, it's scale symmetry from the CFT point of view. From the ADS point of view, it's some particular sort of walking in a certain direction. And special conformal transformations, these things that were very bizarre, have their equal equivalent in five dimensions. They are, look equally bizarre, except they are precisely the ADS equivalent of rotating the illusory direction into the usual directions. So this illusion, you might say, well, you kind of just called it a dimension. It's not really a dimension. It's something else. But there's this magical symmetry that we get for free in quantum field theory, which tells us that the illusion and the real thing are rotatable into each other. And so we should really not call it an illusion anymore. We should call it a duality. Note that the whole trick of taking scale invariant physics on the page and reading it as non-scale invariant physics but in, in, in a higher dimension is that in the higher dimensional view, there really is a mass scale, a length scale. There are length scales in the theory. Okay. From the higher dimensional point of view, I'm in a regular, that's the trade we made. We're not very familiar with Bohr atoms that are changeable. We try to count on our Bohr, atom, Bohr radius being, sorry, the Bohr radius. We, we count on our Bohr radius being fixed. So we're not used to it when it changes. Well, when you go to the illusory world, the Bohr radius is fixed. If it looks like it's bigger or smaller, it's only that it's further back or closer. Okay. Now. There's a kind of master formula for what kind of mass scales are out there. Um, and you can do it, you can sort of get a sense of it by understanding from the CFT side that local operators, their renormalization group scaling goes like, remember W is keeping track of scaling. The amount of rescaling you do to some scale dimension, the true scale dimension, 
of a local operator. That's how it works in field theory. From the ADS point of view, if you have a particle, if this or whatever state we're talking about is a particle that mediates a Yukawa force, then that should go like e to the minus the five-dimensional mass scale times something like the proper length. And if you look at the previous metric, w is not the proper length in the extra dimension. It's log w that's the proper length. OK, so you'd expect something like this. If you compare these two kinds of ways of sensing this uh, state okay, and the force that it mediates, then you can read off that five-dimensional masses are s produced in units of the radius of curvature and the scale dimension of local operators. Okay. The other big surprise is that the ADS dual contains we didn't put in quantum gravity. We just put in a conformal field theory. But you get out a quantum gravity theory at the end of the day, a five-dimensional quantum gravity. Okay? One way you can sort of see it is that surely this illusion breaks down when it get, the pictures get too crowded. If I'm trying to draw a picture of a girl and then another girl standing behind her, so there's a line of girls going into class, uh, standing one behind the other, then in, in the fifth dimensional sense, then in the CFT, it has to be rendered by sort of plonking states on top of each other on the page. And it gets so crowded that you might think in some counting of information sense, you can't possibly faithfully represent everything that can happen in five dimensions with just a four dimensional piece of paper. Something has to go wrong. Something has to break down. And guess what it does? You don't get to know about all this. If it gets too crowded, you form a black hole. Why? Because really, there's five-dimensional gravity in the illusion. You can even say who the graviton is. The energy momentum tensor of the CFT acting on the vacuum is a point-like graviton at a, at a, at a, at a distance. It's, it's spin two. And if you really count the number of polarizations, they're too few to be the polarizations of massive spin two in five dimensions. If you count them, they're just right to be the number of polarizations of a massless spin two particle. As you know, massless higher spin particles have fewer polarizations. All the polarizations are in the transverse direction to that of propagation. Okay? So this is the theory with quantum gravity. Um, now here's where the strong coupling expansion kicks in. All of this geometrizing is only going to be any use if I can calculate, at least in the dual theory. But a weakly coupled ADS theory, which is what we'd like, in fact, can only come from a strongly coupled CFT. Okay? And for example, a weakly coupled ADS theory would be, since we know we have to have gravity in, in that, here's an ADS gravity Lagrangian in five dimensions, where capital G is the five-dimensional metric. And, and it's given by the sort of Einstein term in higher dimensions, so some higher dimension G Newton, and a higher dimensional cosmological constant. Why a cosmological constant? Because you want one of the solutions to Einstein's equations to describe anti de Sitter space, the vacuum of this world. OK? But in order to trust this Lagrangian, any heavier particles, for example, if this, this is a theory of classical general relativity, if you want the quantum theory involving, say, string theory or whatever else is living at high energies close to the Planck scale, then you want all the other particles to be very heavy so that you can trust general relativity as describing the long distance physics. That would describe a weakly coupled effective field theory in ADS. Whereas if you take a weakly coupled CFT and you say maybe a weakly coupled CFT gives a weakly coupled ADS, if you are that hopeful, you're quickly proven wrong because in fact there are lots of local operators. Remember the states of the CFT, the local operators of the CFT are equivalent to the states of ADS. And the local operators of the CFT contain lots of generalizations if you, if you have, say, free field theory, there are lots of generalizations of the energy momentum tensor, which are all, if you do the detective work, 
all correspond to five-dimensional massless particles. So you have an infinite number of five-dimensional massless particles. You are not doing standard effective field theory, which where we like to say there are five particles and they have weak interactions. Here, you can't even get started. There are an infinite number of particles. You don't know how to start writing down a sensible theory that you can calculate with. Okay? So, in fact, the moral is that strong goes to weak, and weak, in some sense, goes to strong. So a strongly coupled CFT, however, this is the thing we started with as our tough problem, can easily turn into, and naturally turns into, an, a weakly coupled theory of ADS quantum gravity with a large regime of just classical gravity um, and gauge theory. Okay, so I could extend this also to include gauge theory. And of course, like standard quantum gravity, it's non-renormalizable, or a standard quantization of general relativity, it's not renormalizable. So there should be some sort of UV completion. This theory is completely complete. It's scale invariant. Nothing breaks down at high short distances. So secretly, this theory must also contain all the ingredients to make it a full theory of quantum gravity. Um, it's so-called UV complete. For example, string theory. Okay, and the most the best understood version of this story is um, N equals 4, Susie Yang Mills as a conformal field theory, and type 2B string theory in ADS. But for our purposes, we are trying to make contact with the real world, and we want to say the following thing. What we'd really like is to think about strong dynamics. Uh, in, in the usual four-dimensional sense. And we want to, you know, we're weak. <laughs> so, I mean, we are, the, the dynamics is strong, hence we are weak. And we want to say, well, can we make some assumptions about the strong dynamics and see where it leads us? After all, we have experiments to catch us. And, um, but when you make a set of assumptions, you'd at least like them to be self-consistent assumptions, okay? And then we can try and follow the consequences. Well. In that sense, the way you should read this duality is that by playing with ADS effective field theories without worrying about whether they're UV completable or not, you are secretly, the, the sort of effective field theory self-consistency translates into the self-consistency of dynamical assumptions about strong dynamics. This is exactly the kind of tool we need for rapid exploration of phenomenological possibilities at the LHC and, and beyond, okay? Yeah, actually the implication sign is, is milder, and I'll say it like this. If you have a weakly coupled theory on the ADS side, if you're so lucky that your theory has a weakly, a CFT dual has a weakly coupled theory description in terms of ADS general relativity and gauge theory, then it must be strongly coupled on the CFT side because the weakly coupled CFT we can prove has got too many particles to make a kind of weakly coupled theory here. My conjecture, consistent with all the, I don't think it's just mine, but my conjecture, consistent with every example we know, is that unless there's some special symmetry at work, as soon as you go to strong coupling here, basically everybody in the ADS side who could become heavy becomes very heavy, and you're left with sort of these classic massless fields. So I'm going to short circuit and, and just say this, OK? But in order to say everything, to give you the overarching view that I'm trying to do, uh, I'm going to cut corners on every slide, which you can catch me at, OK? Um, OK. Now, having got this far, and I should just ask, on what minute am I? Does it, do you, Great, perfect. Um, we don't want four-dimensional scale invariance. That was like the Ising model, which we just got to to warm up while learning StatMech. We actually want something a little trickier. We want strong coupling to end. After all, we don't have, sorry, scale invariance to end. 
the world we are in does not have scale invariants. We would like whatever BSM scale invariant thing happens, it shouldn't be scale invariant all the way down to uh, our energies. So that can easily happen. Instead of saying that we have an exact zero of the fixed point, maybe the coupling that we're at is merely a place where the beta function is very small, but not zero. So the coupling keeps evolving and evolving and evolving over a large range of energies because it's evolving very slowly. But eventually it gets to be strong and then boom, confinement or some other drastic change of variables kicks in and the standard model, or at least the standard model Higgs sector, emerges from the infrared dregs, the way that pions emerge from QCD in the far infrared, okay, after confinement and all the fireworks at 1 GeV take place, okay? That's the game plan. In fact, even in the UV, we know that scale invariance in the real world would have to be badly broken because general relativity or quantum gra or gravity becomes strong close to the Planck scale and almost you cannot sort of separate it out. It's coupled to everything else. And so you have if you, once you include four-dimensional general relativity, not five-dimensional, four-dimensional general relativity, not the illusion, the real world, gravity, then you must also have scale invariance broken in the far UV, and it's broken in the far IR, and uh, so only in the middle can you say there's some sort of approximate scale invariance possible. So just as an example of here, you can play with this beta function. If your beta function is just a little, your, say, a little bit away from a fixed point, and the beta function looks just linearizing, linearize the beta function away from the fixed point, then you can write like this, and if this epsilon happens to be even modestly small, you call that a tuning, it would be a very mild tuning, then you can quickly work out the solution to a beta function like this, and you find the coupling is evolving very, very slowly. So for example, the time, the, 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 the coupling goes twice as far from the fixed point only after a very large hierarchy. You can play with this formula and just see for yourself. Okay. So you can have a very slowly moving coupling. So the picture should look like this in your head. Okay, we haven't build, built any models. But here's the Planck scale, and here is, if you want, here's the Planck length, and here is the length scale at which we are operating and which the hierarchy problem exists. And we want to think of zooming in and zooming out and, and calling that the fifth dimension. And there's a interval that we have to live in where we have approximate scale invariance. We only have approximate scale invariance at best between the Planck scale and the scales at which we know there is no scale invariance, like right now, okay? Um, so only in this, in this window and in the fifth dimension that corresponds to this window. Okay, some choice of these two things. So that means that the fifth dimension is really not going on forever. It is got to be some sort of window like that. Okay. So the stage on which particle physics is supposed to play out, I'm now drawing it like this. These vertical planes are meant to be three plus one dimensional space time. And this interval that I'm talking about is here. Instead of being all of ADS, it's a slice of ADS, okay? And you, what we showed back then was the suitable boundary conditions. You always have to have boundary conditions when you solve Einstein's equations and so on. You can impose this slice, okay? And if you work in terms of the proper length, you only need a modest ratio of proper length to of curvature in order to get large hierarchy uh, in this way, okay? This L, I'm not going to go into it for lack of time, but this actual size L, uh, you might say you can cut it like this or I could cut it like this. So who's deciding what L is, okay? And uh, indeed, once you include the dual of this physics, so some operator has coupling alpha, right? That operator is dual to some scalar field in ADS, and if you study the back reaction on the geometry of that scalar dynamics, then you can show that getting an L, which is 
several times bigger than the radius of curvature is totally natural. The tuning you're doing is very mild. That's the so-called Goldberger Wise mechanism. So this is the stage on which everything takes place. Um, and, if, and you might have noticed that it looks a lot like a waveguide, and that's exactly what it is. Um, so we should just quickly review what life in a waveguide is like. Um, so again, for lack of time, I'm going to try and describe life in a flat waveguide, except the number of long dimensions is 3 plus 1, and the number of short, the cross-section of the waveguide is just a one-dimensional interval. Okay, it's not even like this or something. It's not a rectangle. But it's a waveguide, and we, do, we approach it in the same way. So let me just take a five-dimensional scalar field and say it's a field in a waveguide. What am I supposed to do? We all, we all learn to use separation of variables. So here's the Klein-Gordon equation in five dimensions. Here I separate it into the part that takes advantage of the translation and variance along the guide and something a mode transverse. And you can then solve for the transverse mode, since you've gone to Fourier language here, it looks just like a one-dimensional problem. And because this problem is a problem in a compact box, you get a discrete spectrum of possible modes. Sorry, this is a mistake. This would be psi n of w, w. And the possible eigenvalues for this p squared is given by these mn squareds. So you see, p mu squared is what a four-dimensional person calls mass. So these are four-dimensional mass squared eigenvalues coming out of this five-dimensional massive wave equation. Okay, so one shouldn't dis distinguish the five-dimensional mass from the four-dimensional masses that an experimentalist would call mass. Okay, that's what this guy. You get a discrete spectrum like this. In fact, using the completeness of this eigenbasis, you can expand the, um, the original scalar field in this basis with coefficients which are functions only of x, and hence they look like just four-dimensional fields. So this is just separation of variables. And now you can do what is called a Kaluza-Klein decomposition. You take the five-dimensional action, say, for example, this one, uh, integrate by parts just to make it a little easier, and plug in that complete, uh, that Kaluza-Klein decomposition. And using the fact that you're diagonalizing this operator by the choice of basis, you get an infinite tower of four-dimensional particles, of four-dimensional fields, and all these interactions you can break up as interacting sets of four-dimensional fields. And all these many couplings for these many different types of uh, four-dimensional fields are just coming from wave function overlaps. Okay, So the message is five-dimensional theory turns into an infinite number of four-dimensional fields interacting with each other. And the couplings depend on the inter wave function overlaps in the extra dimension of all the different modes in any particular interaction. Okay, that's the game plan. And if all of the modes are heavy, except for the first one, usually called the zeroth one, you can write a four-dimensional effective theory, which at leading order would just be keeping only the zeroth fields as the light guys and imagining that all the other ones are heavy, and you'd get something that looks like this. So you can imagine in some grand way that the standard model, four-dimensional standard model, comes from something that looks like this, but sitting on top of it are many Kaluza-Klein modes yet to be discovered. Um, you also have to have suitable boundary conditions because you're living in a waveguide and there are many ways to specify them and you can study all of the different ways. But the quick thing to go through is that by choice of boundary conditions, you can robustly have the lowest mode having a four-dimensional mass which is smaller than the five-dimensional mass. Okay? If you go through that and just solve that equation, then you see that you have a solution. What happens when this is smaller than this is that the, z the, the mode looks like an exponential that is leaning either exponentially in this way or it's exponentially in this way. So you get so-called boundary localized modes. Okay? So that's the message of these lightest modes is they tend to be highly localized one way or the other on one boundary or the other. Okay, so now I want to return to the warp stage 
and just read off what the, the message is. So it, amazingly, I just did this scalar field with a mass. But in fact, if we do general relativity in five dimensions, propagating through this waveguide, then even though general relativity doesn't have a mass term, it does have a cosmological constant term. And it, it acts a little bit like a mass term. And uh, so what we had shown in, in 99 is that, in fact, you do get a four-dimensional zero-mode graviton. Okay, so there is this lightest mode of the five-dimensional gravitational field, which is massless in the four-dimensional sense, and it leans exponentially to one side. If you want, you can even write the metric of this mode. Here's a five-dimensional metric, which where the moving part is this four-dimensional zero mode, and you can show that this is the solution. When I've drawn this picture like this, it's because there is this so-called warp factor of anti de Sitter space still there. So the four-dimensional metric is stronger for smaller w than for larger w. Okay. And so secretly, this thing, even though we were trying to just describe the strong dynamics, it automatically unifies the strong dynamics in four dimensions with standard four-dimensional general relativity. Okay. They combine together to have this dual picture of five-dimensional physics in a waveguide. OK, so the punchline for the hierarchy problem is that the Higgs boson, which is another scalar field, or is a scalar field, um, is readily localized on the IR boundary, whereas general relativity is localized on the UV boundary. Okay, And this localization just follows the mechanism I went through. And uh, why is this solving the hierarchy problem or capable of solving the hierarchy problem? It's because, you can say it two, uh, th three ways. One, because this is the mother of mass, the Higgs boson, or at least the masses of all the elementary particles we know. This is the guy that feels mass. It's called four-dimensional gravity. And their overlap, which is determining the strength of all the couplings, is exponentially small. Here's an exponential in proper distance this way. Here's an exponential in proper distance this way. They have a small overlap. And that means that the electroweak symmetry breaking masses given by the Higgs bosons are felt very little by gravity. So, so this is the music for the punchline and <laughs> the end of the movie. Um, but, OK, so, so by the equivalence principle, that's saying that the VEV of electroweak symmetry breaking, gravitational field pushing this way. So when you plunk the Higgs down here, whatever problems you're getting from radiative corrections, which tend to pull the Higgs up to the Planck scale, when you put it in this incredibly strong gravitational field, it redshifts, and it redshifts down to the weak scale. Okay? So if something has too big an energy, and you want to get rid of it, just put it way down a gravitational well, and gravitational time dilation or energy dilation will automatically solve this problem. Yeah. If I had drawn the Higgs like this, so, no, so there's one which is optional and one which is not. It turns out that this, the fact that grav, the four dimensional graviton is leaning towards the UV is set in stone and it is merely the dual reflection of the fact that gravity gets strong in the ultraviolet and there's nothing you can do about it. This was optional. Okay, there really are two cases, but this is a robust, okay? When I use words like readily and so on, those are code words for it's not like the only possibility, it means, but it's at least 50-50 likely. So that, that's what I'm pointing to. This is really saying that this Higgs degree of freedom is something that is emerged only in the infrared. It is really a kind of composite. That's what it's saying. Um, and the high degree of localization is saying that the interpolating operator, remember that the mass which sets, the, the 5D mass which sets this exponent for how rapidly it's climbing is dual to the scaling dimension of the operator that interpolates the Higgs boson, okay? 
And it's saying that it's a high dimension operator. Remember, the solution to the hierarchy problem should be that the Higgs operator, or Higgs mass operator, doesn't have its canonical scaling dimension, but rather has some big anomalous dimensions that make it have a much larger scale dimension. And that makes it sort of very, really plastered onto this wall. Okay. So I know that I'm not giving detailed blow-by-blow -blow accounts of the way to read these pictures. I'm hoping it gets in at some level, but I'm happy to go at, at more detail afterwards. I just want to say that this dictionary exists. It's very pictorial, but it's also very precise when you want to write an equation. OK, so it's a funny thing that's happening. You might say, how did you solve it? What do you mean you really solved? I know that those radiative corrections in the standard model are there. You can't bamboozle me like this, OK? And, uh, and that's because warped effective field theory is something subtle. It's something beautiful, but it's also a little tricky. We start with the hierarchy problem saying, look, here's the Higgs boson down at the weak scale. Here's some cutoff of the standard model up at the Planck scale. Why aren't radiative corrections dragging this up to here? Okay, why is the Higgs boson not being carried up to the sky by radiative corrections? And the answer is secretly because the sky is coming down to the weak scale because of this incredible red shifting. Not only is the Higgs boson VEV being red shifted down to the weak scale relative to the four dimensional Planck scale, but every mass scale, any particle that comes into this region will have its mass scales so-called warped down or red shifted down. That's also true of Earth. Any object that you put down on the ground rather than a balloon will have a tiny little red shift in terms of the clock speed. Well, the same is true here, except that the red shift is an incredibly strong exponential effect including whatever UV completes this quantum gravity theory, any string excitations, or basically the cutoff of this effective field theory is going to come down. Um, so there is no hierarchy problem, because there's no very large hierarchy here. But then you might ask, what about all the flavor and electroweak and compositeness tests and grand unified theories and so on that suggest that there are higher scales than just the TV scale? And that's where the warped effective field theory is more nuanced. Because we can always have, say, the fermions that we test so well, the light fermions, the light quarks, the light, electro the light leptons, we can have them living or have them localized exponentially further on the other, on the other boundary. Okay? Then they are going to not say that the sky is just above their heads they're going to say that the cutoff of effective field theory is truly Planckian. It's only the Higgs boson that thinks that the cutoff of effective field theory is low. So the cutoff of effective field theory is low here, but high here. And that's warped effective field theory. Okay? In fact, this picture is very nice because it answers, it gives a plausible solution to the flavor problem. It says that if you want, here's a left-handed quark, here's a right-handed quark, and here's the Higgs. And you want to say, what is the effective four-dimensional coupling of the zero mode? So here are zero modes exponentially localized. And you want to say, what is the zero mode, or if you want the standard model, uh, Yukawa coupling? Well, it's going to be some five-dimensional Yukawa coupling times the, exp times the wave function overlaps. There they are. Now, it is robust that the sharpest exponential here is the Higgs. So this. You know, these are all exponentially sensitive to the exponents, but it's plausible that this guy has the biggest exponent and is exponentially really tight, and these guys are not. When you do integrals of products of exponentials leaning this way and this way, typically one side wins. The integral is either dominated right on this edge or right on this edge. Play around with some exponentials and you'll see that. So if, it, if this guy is trying to dominate this integral, then what you'll end up with is just, it's, it's, uh, I hope you can see it here, you'll end up with the wave function of this quark evaluated on this boundary times the wave function of this quark evaluated on this boundary times some order one wave value of the wave function of this Higgs here times this Yukawa matrix. And you can see this is basically the structure of flavor that I was trying to push on you earlier as very suggestive of the data. There's something which is like exponentially sensitive, some exponential tail, 
let's call it epsilon j, j is the generation right, and there's another one epsilon i left at time sum non-hierarchical. The philosophy is that in five dimensions, nothing is particularly hierarchical. Some non-hierarchical Yukawa coupling. So some order one random numbers times epsilon left times epsilon right. And that is sort of smells a lot like the way the data looks, the pattern that we see. And indeed, it is precisely dual to a story that involves, I won't go through this because I think I'm going to run out of time. Uh, it is dual to a story in which uh, the quarks are external to the strong dynamics, but they couple to strong dynamics operators, and there are RG effects that give exactly this kind of structure to um, flavor. Uh, you might say, well, that's very nice for, for, for the quarks, but leptons are surely different because the sort of surprise of the neutrino sector is that the, the neutrinos are not very hierarchical. So there, it's all very nice for the charged leptons, say left-handed leptons, right-handed leptons, that seems to fit the kind of hierarchical structure of charged lepton masses, but neutrinos don't seem to be like that. You're not getting sort of hierarchical uh, neutrino structure, or at least it's not in some big way that sort of yells out that this is the right story. If anything, it's a bit of a surprise given what you saw in the quark sector. However, there is a nice, Thing that didn't have to be there, which is here automatically, that short circuits this hierarchical structure and gives you a more anarchic structure. If you take neutrinos, so here's the right-handed neutrino. Let me, it's easiest to say, and maybe it's most elegant for Dirac neutrinos. If you take right-handed neutrinos and you say, I want to get really light fermions, then I should take more and more. The reason that a fermion is light is because one of its chiralities, or both, have very small overlap with the Higgs. So here is this right-handed neutrino, which is really getting plastered on this wall. And therefore, it's giving very light neutrinos. However, if it really is getting more and more plastered, I say, what, what's the limit of lighter and lighter fermions? Let me make them lighter and lighter. Then, in the end, this thing is going to be more exponentially localized here than the Higgs is localized here. Okay. So finally, you can always take a localization on the, of fermions which overwhelms the Higgs localization. All of a sudden, this, ex, this overlap integral switches from being dominated to just evaluating everything on the right and switches to being everything evaluated on the left, okay? As you move the parameters, which are the five-dimensional mass parameters. And so all of a sudden, the lightest possible fermions if you just at least the logical limit, if you make fermions sufficiently light, you will have a sudden transition and you'll end up with evaluating wave functions on the left where they are no longer hierarchical in flavor. These wave functions here are not hierarchical, they're just hierarchical here. And you'll end up with a kind of anarchic structure. Okay? Now, at some zeroth approximation, I don't know what you see in the neutrino data, but it looks vaguely no, anarchic. They're very light because you have the wave function of the Higgs being measured at its tail. On the other hand, flavor anarchic. What happened in the quark case, the previous uh, slide? Yeah. In the quark case, it looked like this, where if you say, look, the quarks, as long as you don't hit the point where, as long as your fermions are less localized on this side than the Higgs boson is localized on this side, then the Higgs will win. The most localized field will always win in an exponential, a product of exponential integral. And so the thing that fits the data is to say that even the lightest quark masses are still not localized enough. They're heavy enough that this integral, this in overlap integral, is dominated on this side where you get a very hierarchical structure because these flavor tails are very hierarchical. Over here, things are not very hierarchical, but over here they are. And when neutrinos come in, the way to f see what looks like the data is to say that they are so light that they are, they're, they're now the dominant, they're the most localized game player in the game, 
even more localized on this side than the Higgs is on this side. So when you calculate the over overlap integral, you sure get a small answer, but it is a no an, an anarchic answer because there's not much flavor structure here. There's not much hierarchical structure here. Okay. Sure. Okay, so one can go through gauge fields, I won't, um, just to say you find they have these kind of flat profiles. You can even play with different boundary conditions. And uh, you should. You should say, what can you do in this waveguide? Just explore all the options. You find that, for example, if you have Neumann boundary conditions in the infrared and Dirichlet in the ultraviolet, you don't have any gauge. So this is not what you want for standard model gauge fields. Instead, what you get is a, you don't get zero mode gauge fields, nothing to identify with the standard model gauge fields. But you get symmetries which are only broken at the very highest scales near the Planck scale. So for most energy scales, they are good symmetries. And they are so-called custodial symmetries. Okay? For example, they can act as a U1 baryon number, or the electroweak custodial symmetry, or even something that helps with unification. And um, so let me just finish up with this. Unification, you can even consider as a SU5 gauge theory in the warped case where the boundary conditions on the, in the ultraviolet distinguish the 3 to 1 from the other generators. And surprisingly, non-trivially, when you put in the flavor-dependent profiles needed to fit the quark masses, you find that the standard model differential running, the running of the gauge couplings in the ultraviolet, is affected by the top being composite, namely leaning on this side in order to have a big top mass. And you get a rather nice unification. There are Kaluza-Klein excitations as well. There's the higher modes. Instead of being sinusoidal, as in a familiar waveguide, because of the warping, they lead, lean to one side. And they are anti-aligned with the light quarks, which means that the flavor changing effects and so on that they mediate are wave function suppressed. And so you have a generalization of the gym mechanism. And um, so you, you might want to produce these Kaluza-Klein excitations. And because they are aligned with the heaviest fermions, they tend to decay into those heaviest fermions. Here is a quick cartoon. Protons collide at the LHC. You can produce Kaluza-Klein excitations, which then decay into top quarks. And the top quarks decay into jets. This is the kind of thing, this is a sort of, I think, from last year. But this is the kind of thing the experiments are doing, just to say it's a hard game because there's a huge top background. And then here in this dotted case is the example of what a Kaluza-Klein resonance would look like. Um, it looks rather big because they're aiming at fairly low mass scales, whereas the game is probably most motivated for several TV Kaluza-Klein excitations. Um, OK, I think I'm going to drop all that and just summarize. The picture I'm trying to draw is to say very much a theorist's view uh, which I would summarize by saying, how to make a universe. Um, and that is, you take a random five-dimensional theory, random five-dimensional general relativity and gauge theory, where all the mass parameters are comparable, no big hierarchies, all the couplings are order one, randomly chosen. You shake it around, you throw some boundary conditions, some Neumann, Dirichlet, 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 Neumann, Neumann, you know, you throw all of those things around, and then you unpack it. And you see that you get things like um, large hierarchies between the scales at which gauge symmetries are broken and the gravitational scale. You get things like flavor and CKM hierarchies with those special uh, correlations that we t see in nature. You get protective symmetries like U1 baryon number. You get candidates for Higgs bosons, which I didn't talk about. You get things that look like some sort of unification. Um, these are all the kinds of things. Um, that uh, I think the whole package has got to be taken seriously because it correlates so many hints that we have. So I'm sorry I went over time. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for this very beautiful talk. But uh, the talk is open for discussion now. Maybe for about uh, five minutes. Is that OK by the audience? So in five minutes, whoever uh, wants to ask questions, comments. No questions? Yeah. Uh, 
Sir, would you please go back to the uh, that graph where you showed that QL zero and QL bar QR bar zero, and then uh, one is for quarks and one is for electrons. You showed. I mean, okay. the colors. Are, uh, do you want the quarks or the uh, leptons? This is QLI and QRJ. So yeah. for the leptons, you have just reversed that. You know, the previous line was that was written ERJ and uh, LJ. I mean, why is that so? No, I think I just chose them in the spirit of randomness, uh, randomly. What I'm really showing you in this picture is that let's suppose we have a you have to imagine, again, this is a kind of thing that theorists gets to play with alternate universes. So imagine taking our standard model and just fixing the leptons, the charged leptons, fitting them to some choice that fits the charge masses. So choose a, a left-handed profile, or if you want the exponent of localization, and choose the right-handed exponent of localization for different generations such that these overlap integrals give the correct Yukawa couplings, they give the right charge masses. Whatever this picture is, whether this is leaning more than this or this is leaning more than this, I, I just chose at random, what I'm really pointing to in this slide is now imagine a world in which we make neutrinos, say Dirac neutrinos, let's suppose I make them lighter and lighter and lighter, keeping everything else fixed keeping this guy fixed, and since this is part of the charged case as well as the neutral case, the neutrino case, let's keep it fixed and keep this fixed, okay? Keep all of these things which have anything to do with the charged guy fixed. Well, I keep taking neutrinos lighter and lighter and lighter, where the only lever I have is to make this more and more localized because the neutrino mass comes from this purple guy and this blue guy, right? If this guy is being pinned by fixing everything about the charged case, then I just have to make this more and more localized. What happens to this product of exponentials when this exponential is getting the most drastically localized is that what used to be dominated on this side suddenly becomes dominated on this side. And that's what I was pointing to. That there's a sudden switch in the behavior as you move through parameter space of the five-dimensional model. We seem to live for neutrinos on this side of the uh, parameter space. There is a way, I forgot, I have to play with it again, but there is a way of doing Majorana neutrinos. It's a little bit more, uh, it's not quite as elegant, but I think it's, you know, one should not dismiss it for that reason. The thing that's slightly trickier about it is, you know, some of our most sensitive tests about flavor come from the absence of flavor changing charged decays, like mu to e gamma. And in the Majorana case, the physics of charged flavor changing, I mean, the charged uh, decays is entangled a bit with the neutrino story. And so you have to tune a little bit to escape danger. The Dirac case just is, it's cleaner, but in, I only chose it here for pedagogical reasons. I didn't have to talk about the Majorana case. Uh, can I ask a question about ADS CFT? Yeah. Responders? Uh, these are the people uh, in condensed matter. Yep. Uh, theorists also use ADS CFT correspondence. But yep. What I don't understand is uh, you have to use ADS, uh, CF, uh, ADS background. But in real in condensed matter, uh, the background is not ADS uh, background. It is just flat uh, uh, space time. But how they actually relate to conformal field theory and uh, gravity uh, uh, relation? Uh, so the what? classic, so there are a number of refinements and refinements on refinements in the condensed matter applications of ADS-CFT. But let me just stick to the most minimal one that you can probably relate to this, which is um, one of the things that you might want to study in condensed matter physics uh, is a system which is, say, at finite temperature. So, again, conformal field theories are nothing new in condensed matter physics. In some sense, perhaps they first emerged in a really solid way there 
where you have at long distances, you have fixed points of the renormalization group flow and you have conformal field theory. That's not in itself so surprising. At finite temperature, the dual of a conformal field theory at finite temperature is a large black hole in ADS. Uh, large meaning the size of the black hole is comparable to the radius of curvature of anti de Sitter space. So one of the key things that they have been using is the fact that finite temperature effects and finite temperature quantum field theory is a real tough thing to deal with technically and finite temperature field theory at strong coupling is infinitely harder. But then you have this beautiful description as just it's a black hole in ADS where a number of semi-classical techniques, just keeping track of the Hawking radiation, allows you to do a calculation. Um, so that's sort of the spirit of it. Then there are other things that they do, which is they study, for example, a Fermi surface, which completely breaks the relativistic symmetries spontaneously. Uh, that would, at finite temperature, with that kind of thing, would look like charged black holes, and so on and so on. So the, there's a game of turning condensed matter problems into problems about studying black holes of various, with various properties. So far, um, so far it would be fair to say they keep the spirit of the condensed matter problem, but they are not likely to, to be sort of quantitatively accurate. In that sense, it's a kind of a imaginary condensed matter system which looks qualitatively similar at best to a real world system, but, it, in, but you happen to be able to solve it by using ADS-CFT duality. Um, so I don't know if that answered what they do. Uh, is it correct? I mean, we have to use the same ADS uh, background uh, in the conformal field theory and uh, the steam uh, with the ADS uh, uh, background, or on the one side, I mean, conformal field theory, we don't have to use the uh, ADS uh, background. So just like, just like uh, in any field theory, the background that you use is to some extent your choice. If I'm doing quantum field theory, if I'm doing quantum electrodynamics, say I'm studying anti-hydrogen in an Earth's gravitational field, I get to use the Earth as part of my background. You can't stop me. That would, okay. Or then you can't say you have to do only QED in the vacuum. So we're used to that. We know how to do it. We're good at it. The condensed matter guys, they don't want to talk about physics in the conformal field theory vacuum. They want to take physics in a highly populated vacuum, either one with finite chemical potential or finite temperature. And so they keep the same Lagrangian, but they have turned on a different background. And that is in the ADS side, like instead of taking pure ADS, they take the same Lagrangian of the ADS theory but they consider a black hole background or a charged black hole background. So I think that's the distinction.